What is up my friends? How's it going? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're buckled up and strapped in because today's episode is my most exciting model that I have done to date. To celebrate my Instagram's first birthday last Friday, I decided to remake my first ever post on there, which was of the Dancer of the Boreal Valley from the Dark Souls board game. And I thought, what better way to celebrate one year's worth of painting than to do a comparison between my latest model to my first ever one. So let's get into how I did this one foot tall beast of a model. And engage in jolly cooperation. Day one. As you can see, what I have here is a large base that I printed in four parts and glued together. And this absolute mammoth of a dancer, which I got from Zkino, Zkino? I'll leave a link to the STL file in the description if you're keen to print your own. Now, I printed the dancer in three separate parts. The arms and cape came separate to the body, and I glued them together and covered some little areas with epoxy putty to cover up some marks left by the printing supports. It's a pretty cool looking model. I say pretty cool, it's underselling it. It's a fucking awesome looking model. The size and scale of it, I think is captured really well. The movement of the cape looks awesome as it's like caught mid flight. The two swords in preparation for battle as she looks like she's lurching forward, all comes together to make this a really sick looking model. And I'm pretty nervous and pretty excited to paint it. So my plan is to start with the base and it's to create a sort of tiled cathedral look to kind of fit with the theme of where you fight her in that cathedral area. But I have this wooden style base because it's the only one I had available which could be printed to this size, which the dancer could actually easily stand on. I also printed out this little gothic piece here, which I'm gonna have sit in the center and sort of build the tiles around because it's a nice circular sort of shape. And I have this nice little gothic window frame which I broke in two as it's gonna sit on the tiles as if it's fallen down and broken underneath the dancer. So to get tiling, I bought some of this air drying clay. Now I've never used it before, so I'm not sure what to expect, but from what I've seen of like professional diorama makers, this sort of stuff looks great for sculpting bricks and walls, buildings, etc. I mean, I guess it could be used to sculpt anything really if you're feeling brave or if you have, you know, the skill set. So to start, I'm just going to glue the circular piece down in the center so I can start laying the clay out around it. Now this stuff feels pretty gross. It's very moist and sticky. It actually reminds me of when I was a kid and me and my sister would make stuff with plasticine. You ever used like plasticine before? It was always like super annoying because from a really young age, my sister was always like super good in art. And like whilst I was making like really wonky ass looking dogs with like massive heads and stuff, she was like making super realistic looking horses. So I quickly like gave up on that venture. And here I am 20 years later. Anyway, I digress. What my plan here is to try and evenly get the clay spread out around the base to a thick enough degree that I can start shaping in the circular tile design. And I'm sure there are more refined and dignified ways of doing this, but, but do they involve having fun slapping shit around with a mini spatula? I think not. So once I have a good amount of clay spread out across the base, I'm just using this little sculpting spatula that I have to just try and even it out as much as possible. It's like I'm kind of making the icing on the top of the world's most disappointing cake. And I just spat all over my mic. So I'm just gonna shove some thick flat card on it and try and press down to smooth out a wider area. And with it as even as I want, I'm just using a ruler and a hobby knife to cut in the design of the tiles, starting off with making some central incisions. For this next bit, I'm just improvising the circular cuts with some random circular objects that I have lying around like this duck trio pot that I printed ages ago and never finished. So that's the first circle done and within this I'm just shaping out some tiles. And the next circle I'm using is this slightly wider plate bowl thing that was just lying around. This is probably the first time ever since leaving school that I wish I had a compass with me. And with the circles made, I'm just going back through these lines I've made and just tidy them up and refine them a bit more. Then with a slightly wider implement, I'm just using this file that I have here and just going back through the lines and making them a bit more prominent. Just to make things seem a bit less uniform and a bit more chaotic, I'm just cutting out random tiles, breaking certain bits off as if this dancer was mid-fight and just fucking everything up around her. I decided to try spraying the clay with some water to see if that helps reshape things a bit better and turns out it does. So, you know, have that as a free tip. 
Oh. So back to reshaping it, and I'm just gonna keep working this until I've got all the edges nice and smooth so the tiles all sit nice and flush, but with gaps in between each one. And I think that looks pretty good for now. Apparently you're meant to leave this stuff to set for like a good 24 hours or so, so I'm just gonna pop this outside to do its thing while we move on to the next part. Day two. So here she is, primed and ready for painting. The detail on this model is terrific and I think we can do some really cool stuff here to make it really stand out. I'm going to be attempting some more advanced air spraying techniques with this model today so fingers crossed it doesn't mess up. First off we're going to be attempting some NMM, also known as non-metallic metals. I've been looking into how all the pros make their metal look so shiny yet detailed and it turns out it's not metallic paint at all, hence the term non-metallic metal. It's a combination of different shades of black through the greys to the white and blending together to match the reflection properties of metal. So to begin I'm just going to get out the wet palette, get that prepped and then just to line up my paints in a timeless and pointless ritual. So to begin, we're going to be applying some Zenithal highlighting to the model. What is Zenithal highlighting, you might be asking? What if you're not asking? I'm going to tell you anyway. Zenithal highlights are basically spraying whites from a high up angle on the model to create a strong contrast between lights and darks, as if it was replicating one strong light source. So I'm just using this technique to start outlining where the shine of the metal on the armour would be illuminating from. There are some really great resources online about how metal reacts with light and I'll pop them in the description below so you can go check them out for yourself as well. But it's basically all to do with breaking up the different parts of the models into basic primitive shapes like cylinders, spheres, cubes and the like. And basically replicating how light would react on each shape as if it was on the armour itself, if that makes sense. So you can see the legs have a separate bright strip running down them with concentrated white in the centre. That's because that's how it looks on a cylinder shape, and the kneecaps have one strong light point in the centre which softens off because that's how it would look on a sphere. See how you can sort of break it down into the basic shapes? You can see it's actually already starting to kind of look like metal just from this highlighting job, and I, you know what, I'd, I'd be pretty happy leaving it as is to be honest, but you know, we'll persevere. Now it's much easier doing the cape as it's just a case of hitting the higher points with a more concentrated amount of the ink and keeping the lower points darker to which we'll be applying some coats of contrast paint to. It's always a good idea to black prime the model for zenithal highlighting so you can get this real strong contrast between light and dark. More advanced users sometimes do a blend of grey between white and black so they have more control over the transition but for something like Dark Souls I think the aesthetic really benefits from strong contrasting shades. And above all else, this highlighting technique is also just really handy for you to have a physical reference point of where you're placing your brightest colours and darkest shades as well. Now we're starting off with working on the cape, so I'm just going to mask off all of the armour with some masking tape so we don't discolour our lovely highlight work. And starting off with some Leviathan blue and loading it into the airbrush, adding some thinner, and this will be our first cape base coat. Now with the first colour applied I've got to do a quick colour change. This is a very powerful pigment so it's very important to do a good wash before applying the next colour which will be this wonderfully vivid Talisar Blue. And I'm going to be applying this one to all the lighter parts that you can see are across the cape. And with that done I can now just carefully remove all of the tape and we can get cracking with the armour. So my first step of the NMM process is to spray on the darkest part, which will be Eshin Grey, and nicely thinned out in the airbrush, of course. Now I normally see, you know, good artists doing a wet blend for proper, decent NMM, but this model is so huge that I think we can utilize the airbrush to good effect for it. I mean, who knows, this, this is actually my first experience with the technique, so we'll just have to, you know, cross our fingers and hope for the best. So with the darker shadows done, I'm then mixing in some Celestra Grey into the Eshin Grey to bring a sort of 50-50 mix together thereabouts and moving to smaller areas to begin highlighting. Then after that, just a pure 100% Celestra Grey layer will go on top after that, just to brighten that up slightly. Then I'm just working up through the grey tones to get it even lighter, to which then I'll just be adding a new layer of bright white with the titanium white ink, just to accentuate the sort of the brightest parts of the light. 
Now, I don't really see people doing this, but I thought I'd give it a shot to sort of you know, see what happens. I'm gonna be putting on an ultra thin layer of iron breaker, and I mean thin to which I'm basically making a glaze of to spray across the armor in hopes that it will sort of add a bit of shimmer and glitter onto it, but not take away any of the shading that we've just done. And you know what? I think we got away with it. Now for the sexy part, it's the swords. And the pair of swords that were enchanted and given to the dancer by Pontiff Sullivan. The right with the dark magic and the left with fire. So for the right, we are using Prism Violet Ink, which is from Liquitex Inks, and it is a awesome looking vibrant color to which we should hopefully get a cool glow effect from. So you can see I'm doing this sort of striping effect on the sword, and this is basically called um, the bounce effect, which is supposed to mimic how light falls and bounces on objects. And the scary bit now, which I feel I kind of messed up with the Twin Princes and Yorm and Quaylag, so I'm a bit nervous, it's creating the glow effect that sort of reflects from the sword onto the armor. Now, I'm learning from past mistakes and making sure to start off super thin with all the applications that I'm doing with this. Because if you mess this up, you can't really get it off of the armor job that you've done. Now, for the fire sword, which is going to take a bit more work, I'm starting off with some vibrant orange ink. And with the same method as the dark magic sword, I'm applying this bright orange as the base coat of the fire and then adding in layers for vibrancy towards the middle of the sword. Then with some yellow medium ink, I'm blending between the orange to the brightest parts of the sword where I think most heat would be coming from. I feel like the heat would be at the top of the sword, no? I, th I think? I guess it's kind of up to the painter's discretion, really. And just like with the orange and the purple, I'm just using this yellow to build out some more of the vibrant reflections. Then I'm trying out some fluorescent stuff in using this yellow as basically kind of the brightest part of the fire. It's a bit of a scary technique to apply to a model that you're pretty happy with, especially one this size. I feel with smaller models, you probably have some leeway to cover up mistakes, but with bigger models, it's more noticeable if you fuck up. But then again, smaller models require more control and accuracy, so maybe it's just tricky all round. With both swords base coats done, I'm just going back over the hot points of the swords with some white ink again, so I can start targeting some really bright colors that will basically be triggering the glow effect. I hope. Now, I totally forgot to apply some very important red to the sword, so before we crack on painting the white parts, I'm just going over the bottom of the sword with it. But I wasn't overly happy with the application of the yellows and oranges, so instead of just settling with it, I'm doing the big boy grown up thing of just having some patience and just starting again. So with a base of red at the bottom, I'm just going back up through the oranges to the yellows and building up the light the higher we get up the sword. And now I think, actually, this sword is starting to look like fire, finally. But for some reason, the brights aren't as bright as I want. But I can't make it any brighter than white. Which is when I realized, how do you make white brighter? You don't. You make the stuff around it darker. So with this in mind, I'm applying some carbon black ink to parts of the flames, and that is actually making the bright parts look so much brighter. So through this, I've actually learned that darks are just as important, if not more so, than bright parts when creating glow effects. And with the model done, I can finally breathe a sigh of relief, come back tomorrow, and finish it off. Day 3 Here we are, Day 3, Judgment Day. You can see I've primed the base here with some black, and then I've also sprayed on some dark grey primer onto it as well. And I'm just starting off with painting these candles that are on some rocks, and I'm just painting a first layer of Ishin Grey. And then to highlight them, I'm adding a layer of Administratum Grey on top of that. And then with a mix of White Scar and more Cast Bone, I'm just painting the stem of the candle, the stick, the stick of the candle, the candle. Then for the little flames, I'm just painting them with some Avalon Sunset and then mixing in some white to add some brightness to the tops. For the broken window frame, I'm just doing a base coat of Celestra Grey all over and then adding some darkness in with some Ishin Grey. Mm -hmm. 
Next is the gothic great thing that I printed, and I'm painting this with some dark and shiny iron warriors. Then just dry brushing on some iron breakers to add some more highlight. I'm then just using a big fat old dry brush with some white scar to thinly apply some big strokes of white across the base, targeting mainly the edges of the tiles. Then just filling in these little potholes here with some black. And to tie the whole base together, I'm just loading in some Agrax Earth Shade into the airbrush and spraying one thin layer across all of it. Now for some final touches on the dancer, I just want to edge highlight these little parts on the armor and just adding in some smaller details with some iron breaker to just make these little ridges pop. Now my small sable brush broke earlier, so I'm going to have to use a bit of a larger brush to do this, which is it's far from ideal, but you know, I'll try and make it work and hopefully we won't ruin this lovely model. Now you want a very fine sable brush to do these kinds of detailing work so you don't accidentally slap a load on and ruin your lovely model. Then doing the same with the purple reflection, I'm just edge highlighting on a layer of Nagaroth Knight to make these purples sparkle. And doing the same to the sword as well to bring out some of the detailing and making it stand out from the rest of the sword. Then it's time to paint her headdress thing, and this is gold in the game, so I'm just applying a base coat of Retributor Armor. And this is a super delicate procedure, as I don't want to get any overspill onto the cloak, which isn't made easy by the fact my precision brush broke. But, you know, we persevere. And with that, it's time to get the dancer stuck on the base. So I'm just slapping some heavy duty adhesive to her feet and I've realized that the weight distribution of this model is a little off with her whole shape so it's going to take some balancing to get this to sit right whilst it dries which proves to be quite difficult so I'm going to have to fashion myself a little makeshift rig for her to sit in so I have this sort of handy little remote that I use for my light panels that she can you know rest her knee on and then I can strap her cape down with some masking tape like so and Hopefully that stays and we can just leave her to dry for ages. Now that it's dried, it's time for the final touches. Applying the same method as we did with the reflection on the armor, we're doing the same with the reflections from the candles on the floor with some orange and yellow ink over the top of some white. And then doing the same with the purple over white and just making sure to target the edge of the window to really emphasize this glow reflection. then just some final little touch-ups around. Now for a thing I like to do with all my large models, I like to felt the base so they have some grip and won't scratch or damage any surfaces that they sit on. Also makes me feel like a proper little model boy. This is just some self-adhesive felt which I bought in a big roll, you can find that pretty cheap on Amazon these days. Then just measuring up a square to cut off and then it's just a case of peeling this little bit of paper off nice and gently and placing it down so it lies nice and flat against the felt and just applying some decent pressure to get it all to stick and then making sure to get all these little edges stuck around the bottom as well then with a hobby knife just carefully going around the edges just to get that circle nice and snug there we go the dancer of the boreal valley one of the most iconic bosses in all of Dark Souls. Now this model is one of the few that I've completed and haven't instantly got like imposter syndrome over. I'm actually pretty thrilled with how it's turned out. And for me personally, I think it's a great way to celebrate my one year on Instagram under the pseudonym of Dark Souls Models. So if you've stuck with me this far, thank you for watching all the way to the end. This video is a bit longer than all my other ones as there was a lot more to cover in the process of this one. As ever, if you've enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button, leave a comment if you're so inclined, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I, I can't thank you enough for the support you've given the channel. I can't believe it's been a year since I've started it all. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the positivity you guys send my way, and it's, it's really exciting that I get to share this journey with you all. So, anyway, enough soppy stuff from me. Peace out, guys, and until the next one, don't go hollow.